So, uh, we're now moving on to Section 3, um, Positional Bargaining. We're going to go to the table and uh, work with you on uh, how uh, you should make offers, uh, concessions, how to deal with impasse, etc. So, uh, it's an important section. Um, the content is quite a bit, so we're definitely going to uh, go beyond one video, video probably, I would think, three on this, maybe even four. Um, and, uh, and I guess the other point to make is that it's not as though I have, uh, I can sort of say here's some special points I want you to take away. Uh, it's a section which is uh, really full of all sorts of uh, tips and suggestions. Um, I think you should know pretty well all of them uh, in the sense of having them there in your bag of tricks or, or uh, options that you can use at different times uh, depending upon circumstances. So um, it's, it's quite content heavy and so why don't we get on with it uh, right away. Um, you can see I'm going to deal with bargaining style, uh, just a little bit of an opening there. Um, then we're going to get into the um, best practices for openings and concessions. We're going to move into the areas where maybe a little bit more complicated bluffing and bluffing impasse and final offers and, and how to deal with impasse and closing. Anyway, it's a it's a heavy it's quite a heavy uh, schedule. So as I said, away we go here. Uh, now, when we talk about um, what the what the style is, the bargaining style. I'm not talking, I'm not referring here to the character aspects uh, of nice guy, tough guy, because these are things and what sort of person you are, these are things we're going to deal with in, in uh, the second module where uh, I try to uh, work a little bit with people's, uh, what, what their general character is, and, and, and we deal with some of the ways to strengthen uh, or to get over, overcome some of their weaknesses, uh, whatever they might be. Uh, here we're really talking about the process, of how we're going to make our offers. Uh, and quite frankly, it can be something that's quite separate from how you are, whether you're a, a nice guy or a tough guy. Um, it, it's really how you're going to work as in terms of, uh, of the package that, that you're going to bring forward in terms of the whole offer process and, and uh, the positional bargaining process. And the style of your character is something that goes on top and can add or take away depending on how it works. Uh, generally, um, the point I'm trying to get across here is that it is a package in the sense that you come in and you usually make your opening positions known, um, may include briefs, um, and uh, you go on to make uh, some opening offers and a series of concessions and final offers, and it, and it sort of all comes together uh, in terms of the way you're supposed to, uh, the way you're doing it. If you're, I mean, you, there may be circumstances where you do change uh, halfway through, and, and that's not out of, out, of the, uh, out of the question, but when you see somebody changing styles, changing characters, um, it's a sign to you that uh, they're adopting another strategy and, and, and it gives certain things away. It's better to be consistent all the way through if you can be. Um, so, I mean, the competitive style, basically, um, it's determined. Uh, you're indicating in your presentation, you know, you're going to have to work real hard here. The opening, uh, opening offers are very optimistic, home runish, but not outrageous. And uh, you've got a small series of concessions, and, and uh, basically what you're trying to do is you're, is you're trying to signal to them that this is a real fight, and, um, and, and that uh, they may have misinterpreted their own position in terms of what's, uh, what's a, a, a proper a settlement of, of the deal. The, um, the flexible um, style tends to be uh, reasonably opening, a reasonable opening, you're suggesting giving signals that you're cooperative, you want to get the thing done, it's important for you. You make a moderate opening, which um, people look at and say, yeah, that's not too bad. And your concessions tend to be going in a, in a direction where uh, it's, uh, they're significant and, and you can see some direction and it looks like it's a, a fairly reasonable result. So really it reflects how you're coming, what your approach is overall to the, um, uh, to, to, to the process of, of, of the bargaining at the table. And uh, there's no, I mean, different things work with different times and there's nothing that prevents um, a nice guy from being both competitive or be, being collaborative. So it's, it's, it's something that they can do quite easily. It's tougher for the tough guy, and more difficult for the tough guy to try to be uh, collaborative, but, but in any event, certainly it's one of the advantages of, of having a style that's more collaborative is that you can be to a certain extent determined uh, without kind of giving away uh, and suggesting that you're really there to, uh, to force yourself too much on the other side from your character. Um, when do you use which one? Probably this is the most important point. Research tends to suggest that when um, there's a large zoppa, uh, a large zone of potential agreement uh, up for grabs, that the competitive style probably works best. So if you're in a situation 
where it looks like there's a lot of risk, a lot of uncertainty, it's not clear what that zone is going to be. Uh, those are the types of circumstances where it's suggested that a competitive style where you try to take as much as you can um, works better. When you've got lots to work with, it's easier to give stuff up, and, and I think that's the idea, so therefore you can take more. Um, for the flexible uh, collaborative style, uh, it works best uh, in circumstances where there doesn't appear to be a lot to argue over. You still should get the deal done whenever you have a positive um, ZOP. I mean, the deal should always be there. That's what a positive ZOP is, but there are circumstances where bargainers, people who conduct bargaining, can actually uh, you know, blow up a, a, a good deal. But generally, if, if, if you're close to impasse or you're into a no zappa, then the feeling is very much that a collaborative style works best. Um, it allows you to deal with um, it allows you to deal with some of the things that you need to get over uh, these hurdles. Um, certainly, you can get intangibles much better uh, if you're using a collaborative style. Um, you can slip off into the competitive style, into the, into the interest negotiating idea of let's let's look for differences here. Let's find a way we can maybe try to make the pot bigger. And uh, so generally, that's that's the concept. Is if you have no zappa or you don't have much to argue over, uh, you're probably best using a, uh, a collaborative style. Um, I don't think there's much else to be said about style. Um, so why don't we move on to uh, the uh, opening offers? Now, what I've done here is I've given set out a series of questions. Seems like the best way to do it. Uh, questions that people may have and provide the answers and as a as a means to discuss the topic. So my first question is, should I be the first one to open? And I think uh, there's a lot of people out there that would suggest the conventional wisdom says, no, you shouldn't be the first uh, to open, always let the other side do it. And uh, I think it turns out, certainly the research supports this, uh, that no, generally you're probably better off making uh, the first offer. And um, certainly there's a lot of reasons. One of the most important reasons is this, um, this influencing tactic called anchoring. Uh, the concept of an anchor is that by making, uh, by making a, an offer first, what you do is you get a chance to sort of set the reference point and you can set it where you want because your, your offer out there kind of sets where the mean should be and where the, where the negotiations should turn around. And it's a very strong cognitive bias we have. It works even when you know uh, that, that it's being done. Uh, that's what some of the researchers suggested. So there are real advantages in, in going first just for the purpose of, of anchoring in terms of trying to capture, uh, capture as much value as you can. Uh, on top of that, it gives you more scope to work with. If you have a greater distance to go, you've got more concessions you can make. You can make it look better to them because look how much I've given away. Um, you get more information, more chances to talk and see what's happening and, and discuss generally. And it certainly avoids the problem uh, of, of trying to go quickly to a final offer because that's something you really shouldn't do. Concession bargaining is, is always best. Um, the problem with um, offers that are made very close to your final offer, or leading with your final offer, is that even if they're a good offer, even if somebody says, look, yeah, that seems to respond, respond to all our needs, there's still this concept of there called the, the winner's curse. And uh, it's a little bit of the idea that people mentioned before will keep going uh, if they think uh, they haven't got the best possible deal. And, and when somebody accepts something up like that up front and they haven't had to fight for it, um, they've sort of got an idea that, gee, I could have done better. I'm afraid it's the greed factor in human writ large. Um, and, and, and where it comes out uh, it can be very problematic is, is that A, people don't feel they've got a, a, a good bargain because they haven't got the best possible deal. And, and secondly, when it comes to getting the deal implemented or executed, uh, you may have problems uh, because they may say, gee, I, I missed something there and they, and they feel badly about themselves. So it's, a, it's a strange, but, but in any event, uh, if you have, if you give yourselves a, a lots of room, um, it, it generally is, is seen as the, um, as kind of the preferred process. Uh, when not to open first? Well, you don't open first when you're in a leverage disadvantage. I think that's the easiest way to say it. And of course, what's leverage and all that, so I can't really go into that, but let's, let's take an example of a leverage disadvantage. When you don't have uh, the information, for, when you don't know the bargaining range, for instance, okay? You don't know the bargaining range, so you're going into this thing blind uh, to a certain extent. They've got all the advantages, and it's something, quite frankly, you should do as part of your strategy. When you're working this thing up, you're going to be working on leverage, you're going to be working on resistance points, and you're going to see who has that advantage and doesn't have that advantage. 
And so therefore, um, as the process begins, you should know that, you should have that idea. But certainly, if you lack information, uh, you're at a leverage disadvantage, and the rule is you don't, you don't make an opening offer into that, because you just don't know what's going on. You have to be super defensive. You have to really uh, gauge it out piece by piece and, and try to work out from the information that you can get uh, over a period of time. The exception to that, of course, is making an outrageous offer, which is sort of off, uh, off the scale, and you don't really have to worry about it. It's not really like making a, an opening offer at all. Uh, but uh, otherwise, um, if you're in a leverage disadvantage, uh, you shouldn't be the first to open. Another case arises pretty rarely, but if you're into really short-term bargaining, where you see yourself going back and forth just a couple of times and you're going to split the difference, you shouldn't open uh, because the reality is that in the end when you come to split the difference and you're the opener uh, you'll find that the mean the place that you settle at there is to your disadvantage uh, it's just the way it is if you if you look at it you'll have made two offers they're going to split and and your highs is basically going to move it uh, uh, move it towards uh, you and not towards them so that's that's the result and obviously as well when relationships are important I, I mean relationships can give rise to leverage disadvantages uh, just on their own but uh, where there are relationship issues, maybe you're into negotiating in any event, but if not, uh, you should generally see if the other side won't make it first so that you don't really step on any toes and, uh, and you're careful not, uh, not to abuse that relationship by asking for something uh, that's, um, you know, that, that's, uh, that's too much. So, uh, I don't think there's anything else on that page. Uh, should I open optimistically or moderately? Once again, research generally suggests yes, optimistically. Uh, and um, obviously there's some exceptions, in, uh, e.g. relationships. And that's because, uh, once again, um, it has to do, has to do with, the, with the anchoring concept uh, and generally the idea that it's going to give you more to work with, more space to work with. Uh, but it depends. Um, you're trying to gain advantage by an optimistic offer and that's what, this, that's what competitive bargaining is usually about. If you're in the circumstances where you want to get the deal done, where you've kind of been almost quasi-negotiating or, or you just want to get the thing done and you're, you're satisfied with, uh, with divvying it up, uh, then in those circumstances an optimistic offer, uh, uh, opening offer may not be the best. Uh, but generally uh, they suggest that you should do that. So uh, what is an optimistic opening? Um, well, it's the highest or lowest uh, opening which can be justified by some standard or some norm. So. Um, if you've got a sale out there, or if you've got some case precedents, uh, you, you take the extreme. Uh, but you want to have some justification, so that uh, when you when you talk across the table, you can you can justify it. Because offers should be offers and concessions should be justified, and it's something that I, as a mediator, see people just not doing. Um, and they should take the they should take the, the, the time to justify it because it's a great influencing tactic. Uh, just using the term because has found to, to be able to influence people. So um, it, that's, that's kind of where it is. So it's, it's, it, it's, it's home run shall we say, uh, but it's, and it's not outrageous, and it should be justified by some standard, but it's the extreme standard that you're looking at, or just outside the extreme standard. So now what I've got here, I put on this, on this page, uh, is, is kind of a bit of a model which maybe will help differentiate uh, the situations and, and uh, moderate uh, openings, uh, uh, optimistic openings, and, and how uh, uh, the outrageous openings are. What we've got here is we have the zone of potential agreement. It's marked in blue, if you can see that. There's the two resistance points. I've used plaintiff and defendant um, uh, as, as my, my uh, models here. The, the, um, what I've done in green here, if that comes out, is, is uh, the negotiator. If the negotiator is doing some positional bargaining, where they're going to make uh, the negotiator's opening offer, and the red is, is the bargainer and the choices that you've got here. And you see I've set the bargainer's expectation point. Uh, I've got an arrow, which means you can move back and forth depending on, on what your strategy is. I'm setting it fairly extreme. It could be on the other side if you want. And then we've got basically got examples of, of what, the, what, the, what the offers are. What's important to note is that all the, the, the moderate uh, bar bargainer's opening uh, offer and the uh, optimistic offer or the hardball offer, what you're going to see is in every case you've kept the zone of potential agreement in play. That's the general rule. Uh, regardless of, of where you are, you always try to keep that in play depending on you know, what you think it is. Um, and clearly what you're trying to do is, is if you're being 
moderate, you're, you're moving more towards that, you're trying to set the anchor here, whereas if you're being optimistic, you're trying to set it out here. And it, it really the idea is that you're trying to set it in such a way that uh, in the end, you're trying to convince the other side that your expectation point and not your resistance point is where the matter should settle. That's what, uh, that's what competitive bargaining basically is. It's, it's, it's a concept of bluffing, trying to disguise that resistance point uh, and get the settlement as close to their resistance point as possible. So I don't know if that's helpful, but uh, that's, uh, that's an example of, of the optimistic versus the uh, moderate, uh, moderate uh, opening offer. Um, question 4A, should I be making offers before a formal bar bargaining session? And it's a good question uh, to a certain extent because uh, it's very easy, certainly as lawyers, to pick up the phone and talk about the case with the other side and get some numbers. And, and um, it's something that does, in, in fact, usually help in the settlement process if you can move it along to, to, to two thirds, three quarters, or something like that. And you come into the mediation. We haven't got a lot to have not a lot of, of, of ground to cover there. The delta is not great, and we should be able to get it done more easily uh, in, in those circumstances. So. Generally, yes, if you're trying to facilitate a settlement, and that's what the process generally is out there for court, for court cases, yes. But the reality is if you're trying to be a competitive bargainer and you're trying to get as much, uh, gain as much advantage and, and claim as much value as you can, it's probably not a good idea. Because what you're doing is you're, is you're telegraphing and you're giving the other side your process and you're already engaging in the offering process and it allows them to think and look and, and, and strategize. and and, and to a certain extent, you're also giving away all sorts of information. I don't know how well you're screening when you're talking on the phone, but you may not be screening at all very well. And uh, you're letting yourself be influenced in, in ways that maybe you haven't all worked out or planned out. Whereas if you go into a formal formal process where you know everybody's set to go there and, and they, they know they're going to prepare briefs and they're going to sit down with the client and they're going to work it all through, and, and it's got a time frame and you've got to get it all done there, um, and you come in with these opening offers and, and you're trying to get anchors set, Anchors will set better if they're first seen without kind of people having time to, to think about and work over them. It's a little bit like framing. You can catch people on framing, uh, how, you, how you put things out there, but it doesn't work well over time. So, so uh, I, I would suggest that uh, if you're really trying to capture, um, capture uh, value, that probably you, you should have one go and do it at, the, uh, at one session. Should you provide numbers or ranges in your brief? Uh, well, certainly if you provide a range in your brief or in your even in your opening statement, uh, right away your lower number is uh, is your offer, is your opening offer. So you've already given away a part of your uh, part of your uh, opening offer that you might have saved in an optimistic opening type situation. If you want to get it done, if you want to show, hey, I'm being, you know, this is what I could and could claim, and this is what I'm actually suggesting is my opening offer. You want to get it done and give that signal, yeah. But if you're there to claim advantage, I wouldn't, and I wouldn't put any numbers in there. I'd just talk about to some of the cases and, and things like that, and then bingo, and make your uh, go in there and, and put it all to them, and here's the, here's the numbers. And, and don't give the other side time to think about it, cogitate it, and say, well, how are we going to deal with this? How are we going to work with that? And particularly, don't break, give them a breakdown, because they can really work with, uh, really work with that. It's, it's something that, uh, that they can, uh, can work up. So that's just a suggestion, but it depends, obviously, as to, as to what you want to, how you want to get done. You want to get it done. Uh, question five: uh, Why why am I tempted to uh, to make a, an outrageous, a hardball offer? And I guess there's a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, an outrageous offer, a hardball offer, can work uh, against inexperienced bargainers uh, who are caught really off guard, and the lawyers aren't there to help them, helping them. Uh, and certainly, a lawyer should should never allow a hardball offer to have any impact on them. But Unfortunately, I've actually seen circumstances where young lawyers just aren't, aren't knowledgeable of the process and uh, they get knocked completely off stride, particularly the client gets knocked off stride. Uh, the whole process is they break up kind of the relationship between the client and the, and the lawyer and the lawyer and the client's left on, the, on, a, on his or her own and, uh, and this outrageous offer uh, just deflates them and makes them anxious and that's what it's supposed to do, uh, such that uh, they say, boy, I've really got a long way to go. They give up. And uh, in the end, um, you end up with a home run. You end up with a home run outcome in the sense that an outcome, an outcome that you would never get, even even with uh, you know with proper bargaining processes, you'd never get it. Uh, uh, the other thing about uh, outrageous uh, hardball offers is that they tend to be best working over time. They tend to work best coming from defendants, the payer. There's kind of more credibility. People are demanding things and don't have to put money down. Uh, to a certain extent, they um, it, it's a little easier for them. 
uh, whereas the payor does. But it tends to work over time, so that it's a bad sign if there's a if there's a, a hardball offer coming in. It means that uh, you can try to work it out, but they may be seeing this as a step in the process type. Uh, a negotiation where they have no intention of getting it done today. They see other opportunities later on where they're going to be able to come back and uh, what they're trying to do is to convince this person that we're going right to the end and, and, and uh, you know, you're not going to get it. Uh, so that uh, uh, time sometimes works better with hardball, hardball offers to make them work. Um, and uh, why is the second reason you would, and I see this a lot actually, if you're the odd man out in a multi-party um, negotiation or, or bargaining session and the other parties want to get it done and you're the odd man out uh, and you come in with a hardball offer it gives you leverage uh, and you see this very often where we've got a bunch of people who maybe are sharing responsibility and and somebody is is quite a bit has quite a bit greater responsibility than the other person and what they're really trying to do is they're trying to get them down to the same levels as everybody else and what they do is they use the uh, the extreme offer the hardball offer and they stick to it they don't negotiate and they won't, won't move off it. And the whole idea is to force uh, the other parties to, to basically concede what they're after. And the reality is the third person in uh, with a group of people who want to get it settled does have leverage. And so unless the parties all work together to exclude that person, which is what they should do immediately, bye-bye, uh, we don't want to talk to you, um, then, uh, then it may very well work. And I'm sorry to say that I've seen a few situations where quite experienced lawyers, I think, uh, have lost out to outrageous hardball negotiators uh, who uh, applied this tactic.